Hello, and welcome to another Love, Serve, Remember Foundation Fellowship online gathering. We are so glad you're here. Uh, I'm Jackie Dobrinska. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Director for the Foundation. And part of my role is to help build community and help us find connection and satsang together. So that is what we are here to do tonight with these fellowship calls. Um, before we begin, I just want to invite you all to settle in and take a nice big deep breath and it, tune into that, that loving awareness and tune into um, the hundreds of other people that are gathered for this call tonight. You know, we can't meet in uh, space together right now. And so we meet on these virtual spaces. And it's really helpful to remember that there's all these people around the world coming together to sit in satsang together. So take that nice moment to breathe that in and know that this is your spiritual family. This is your community. So many of us within this community and beyond, we're sort of asking ourselves right now, what can we do to sustain ourselves in the midst of anxiety and loss? Um, what helps us align with our deepest values? And what uh, supports us in contributing to the well being of others? And to speak to those questions tonight is the beloved Sharon Salzberg. She met Ram Dass in 1971 on one of her first meditation retreats in India. Um, and she encountered Buddhism for the first time, what, about 50 years ago or so, so to help <laughs> bring some clarity and peace. And soon after, started teaching. And in 1976, uh, she with uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield started the Insight Meditation Society. So I guess you've been teaching around the globe since then. Uh, she's authored 12 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Real Happiness. And your most, most recent book is Real Change. Um, and you can find that uh, at SharonSalzberg.com backslash real change. So we're really excited to hear from and talk with her tonight. And I just want to talk to everyone here from the fellowship and beyond about how this sort of works. So Sharon's going to talk to us for a while. We'll do a meditation together and then we'll have a live Q&A and you're all watching from different platforms. And so all you have to do is at any point throughout the evening, type your question into the chat function and then I'll end up reading as many as I can um, to Sharon so that we can um, answer those questions. And so with that, let's open our hearts and our minds and give a nice warm welcome to the beloved Sharon Salzberg. Hi, Sharon. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here and in this community, which I feel is like my community as well. So I actually met Ramdas at my very first meditation retreat. It was January 1971 in Bodh Gaya, India. And I was 18 years old. Um, I'd gone to India as part of a university program in order to learn how to meditate. <clears throat> and Ramdas was there as a student in that retreat. And uh, he was like the patriarch, you know, he was older, he'd already been fired from Harvard, he'd already been to India, he met Neem Karoli Baba, it was, he was Ramdas, you know, and not Richard Alpert. And, um, and later, looking back, I realized, oh, he was like 38 or something like that, you know, but he was the elder. And uh, the famous story in uh, Maharaji circles around the bus really happened from there. We did a number of intensive meditation retreats in a row and then a small group of people who were at that retreat all of whom had pretty ordinary western names except for Ramdas uh you know Jeffrey and Linda and things like that they decided they were going to go in search of Maharaji <coughs> on his bus and sometimes when Krishna Das and I are teaching together we tell that same story for each from our own different angle like I waved goodbye to the bus because I decided I was going to stay on and continue my practice and uh, Krishna Das who at that point was still Jeffrey of course got on the bus and the next time I saw him he was Krishna Das very uh, it was very very interesting to see um, that transformation in in the community and uh, once he asked me when we were teaching Krishna Das did why didn't you get on the bus and I said, like, you don't even know where he was, you know, like, how long did it take you to find him? And he said, about 10 hours, <laughs> you know, so there it is. But I had, I had a different path. And, um, and yet the friendships that were formed at that time have 
been really the mainstay of my life, you know, ever since and, and still now. And in many ways, Ramdas was actually responsible for the entire insight meditation movement and, in fact, the mindfulness movement in this country. When uh, I came back from India, uh, finally, it was 1974, and I came back as a teacher because one of my own teachers, this woman named Deepama, had told me to teach. And my friend Joseph Goldstein had already come back about six months before. And um, he apparently was on like a, he was with some friends in a van and they just drove across the country. And he stopped in Boulder, Colorado and went into the little office that was Naropa Institute's office. And they were about to launch their inaugural summer in 1974. And Joseph went in as he tells the story and he said, well, you know, I was in India for like seven years and my teachers have told me to teach and would you like me to teach? And they said, no, not really. And so he went on uh, with his friends to Berkeley. And one day um, he called Ramdas and left him a message. And, and Ramdas had, I think, a very forbidding message on his answering machine, which is what we used in those days. And, and he said something like, I'm not seeing anybody. I'm not taking any messages. Like, forget it. Um, and Joseph went off to Telegraph Avenue and uh, again, as he tells the story, he had to use a bathroom, so he went into a cafe, and and they said, no, it's only for customers, so instead of buying, like, a bagel or something, Joseph went to another cafe, and then another cafe, and there in the third cafe was Rondas. and so Joseph sat down and talked to him, and Rondas was about himself to go to Boulder, to Naropa Institute, and teach this giant class of like a thousand people and he had little subgroups for that class he had krishnadas doing the chanting subgroup and he asked joseph do you want to teach the meditation subgroup so joseph said yes and he went back to to boulder and jack cornfield was living down the hall and that's where they met and uh, i showed up with a bunch of friends and moved <laughs> our joke was that joseph was our only friend from India that we knew that had a job in an apartment. So I think at one point, nine of us moved into his one bedroom apartment. And this was still the first summer session. And then Joseph was invited to stay on, teach the second session. And I stayed on with him. Then we were invited to teach a retreat and everything built from there. So we used to joke and say, Ramdas gave Joseph his first job here, which was actually true. And so everything we see, you know, the Insight and Meditation Society and all these different centers and and the whole movement um, really in, in so many ways was born from Ramdas and, and his generosity toward his friends. So uh, it, it's quite great, you know, for me to be here tonight. So I do have a book coming out September 1st. It's called Real Change. And basically every word of that book, except for what is now the new preface, was written before the pandemic. And I had a friend post pandemic who was reading it because he was going to excerpt it for something. And he said he, he liked the book, but he was uh, kind of, he was surprised at his own reaction to the examples. Like he'd look at them and think, that's what made you anxious. Wait till you see what's coming your way. You know, so uh, hearing from him, I went to the publisher and I said, could I please write a new preface to sort of, try to ground this book in, in this context, in this time. And they said, okay. And so my overriding question for myself in trying to write this preface was, what's still true in a time of incredible anxiety and disruption and uncertainty? Like, what's still true? What can I rely on? What, what can steady me? What can remind me? of what I really care about and what my aspirations are and, and my sense of purpose, like what's still true. So that was the, the nature of what I was writing and exploring. And so um, it was a very powerful time for me in doing that kind of investigation. It reminded me a little bit of in the Buddhist tradition, uh, the word in Sanskrit is Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A, 
and it's usually translated as the Buddhist teaching or the truth of things or the laws of nature, the way things are. And actually what it more literally means is that which upholds us, that which sustains us. What's still true, no matter what? It also reminded me of this very famous and often sometimes difficult statement of the Buddhas, where he said, hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. Hatred will never cease by hatred. Hatred will only cease by love. This is an eternal law. And it always struck me, the reason, of course, it's difficult is because times in life that's difficult to get to, but it's also uh, kind of ironic. I thought, here's like Mr. Impermanence. You know, all of talked about basically this. Everything changes and everything's ephemeral and it's all, it's all moving. It's all shifting. And it's like, this is an eternal law. This is something we can count on, even if we don't like it, you know, even if it'd be easier to hate than to love. This is an eternal law. So what's still true? And I realized for me, so much of what I was relying on, so much of what was sustaining me, so much of what was upholding my values and guiding me really in, in this period of so much change and uncertainty was my meditation practice. And I, from the beginning, my very first retreat in January of 1971, it was presented to me as a skills training. And as a skills training, the, the other word we might use is tools. It's tools that we can pick up. I co-taught a retreat for survivors of gun violence um, a couple of years ago now. And some of the people uh, who were attending had been teachers in Parkland at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School during the shooting. And, um, and the, the big word of that retreat was tools. <clears throat> you know, we're going to offer you some tools. You can experiment with them. You know, mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, yoga. Make the experiment. See what is interesting to you. And it's yours. So that was a word that was very popular in the retreat. So one of the teachers later told me that the day after the retreat, she was back in Florida, she was back in Parkland, and back at work. And they had to drill. And that, of course, is very reactivating of trauma, is very re-traumatizing. And so she was doubled over in a closet, having a panic attack. But she had the thought, you know what? I have tools. Let me try this. Let me try breathing. Let me try doing this. And it just gave her a kind of support even in such a, a difficult circumstance. So I have been relying on my meditation practice as well in very practical ways. And that's part of what I wanted to talk about tonight. First of all, one of the great skills of meditation is being able to center, to concentrate, to settle our attention, which does a lot of different things. One is it gives us a place of rest. It gives us a respite, not like wiping out thoughts or, or making things not come up, certain emotions not come up, but it gives us a place to rest so that as different thoughts and feelings and whatever come up, we have some space, we have some spaciousness. It helps to gather our energy. They say so much of our energy goes to the past and often to things where we now have some regret, but not in a useful way, like to think about how to make amends or for lessons learned. We just go over and over and over and over something. And or, and I'd say, especially in a time like this, it's an and, our minds go to the future. And we anxiously speculate about a world that has not happened and may never happen, but we're just creating in our minds and so that's a huge loss of our life energy, just pouring out of us into the past and into the future. And what we're doing in the meditative practice is we're gathering, we're gathering our attention and we're settling. Some people don't like the word concentration. I remember I was teaching somewhere once, it was a non-residential weekend and it was like Saturday before lunch. And this guy came to me and he said, 
how much money would it take for me to offer you for you to promise not to use the word concentration again for the rest of the night, the rest of the weekend? And I said, let's talk. So I asked him if every time I use the word concentration, you translated that in your mind to settle or center or steady. How would that work for you? And he said, that works. So I said, you just saved yourself a lot of money because that's really what we're doing. We're gathering and settling. The word really is rest. And I, I wrote one book, Real Happiness, uh, which has a lot of meditation instructions in it. And the first time I got it back from the editor, she said, you're using the word rest a lot. Are you very tired? And I said, well, you're probably, but that's also the word we rest. And one thing I noticed myself in my early meditation practice there in Bodhgaya, well, first of all, as many of you have probably heard me say, I was very contemptuous of the instruction. The first instruction I got was sit and feel your breath. And that would be an example of choosing an object of awareness, which doesn't have to be the breath. It could be a mantra, it could be a sound, it could be an image, whatever. But some object of awareness, we rest our attention on that object. And when our attention wanders, we practice letting go and coming back, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the first instruction I ever heard was sit and feel your breath. And I thought, that is so stupid. Like, I came all the way to India. Where's the magical, esoteric, fantastic technique that's going to wipe out all my emotional suffering and make me a perfectly happy person? Like, that was so stupid. I've been going to school in Buffalo, New York, and I thought I could have stayed in Buffalo to feel my breath. And then I thought, huh, how hard can this be? What will it be, like 800 breaths or 900 breaths? Before my mind starts to wander into my astonishment, it was like one breath, sometimes two. And I'd be gone, and I'd be way gone. And I didn't realize that the most important moment was the next moment after we're gone, when we practice letting go and we practice coming back. So it's really kind of like a resilience training. It's what one of my Tibetan teachers, Sukhna Rinpoche, called let, exercising the letting go muscle. And we come back and we rest. I looked at my experience and I realized one of the reasons it was hard for me actually was because almost as soon as this breath was happening, I was kind of mentally leaning forward to get ready for the next. I was really very frightened. I was very uneasy. I didn't know what might happen next. A lot had already happened to me in my life. And so for me, looking at my experience, balance meant saying something to myself like, Settle back. Let the breath come to you. I used to say to myself, you're breathing anyway. All you need to do is feel it. Because it's so much performance anxiety, it's like I'd never done it before. Like, settle back. Let the breath come to you. So even in what seemed like a, a simplistic instruction, there's so much. There's so much learning as we actually experience it and don't just think about it dismissively. And that process of letting go and being able to begin again, I think in all my years of meditating, which have added up, is probably the biggest life lesson I've ever gotten. Because how many times a day are we beginning again? Like we fall down, we have to pick ourselves up or let someone help us up, we start over. But we have this big aspiration, truly noble. We forget it. We have to start over. Or we have to do a course correction in the middle of something. We have to start over. And it's, it's a continual process. We haven't failed. Nothing's been ruined. Nothing's been destroyed. We can start over. That's kind of like the miracle. So that's the skill of concentration. It's really gathering, being able to see that our attention is scattered without judgment, just come back. And that gives us a lot of power because it, it's like the return of this energy, which could be available to us, but is usually just thrown away. And it's also a kind of healing because it's, it's like 
bringing our energy together, bringing our being together. And it's a, a way of weaving ourselves together, having a sense of integration. So it's a tremendous skill to be able to be practicing. Like I said, it doesn't have to be the breath. There's so many methods, there's so many styles. Um, you can explore, one does explore, and maybe there's several practices that uh, interest you and you do them at different times or whatever, you know, so, uh, but the principle, the way it works is kind of the same. And then it's the skill of mindfulness of being able to pay attention. There are a lot of ways that word is used these days, but it's being able to pay attention to our experience in a different way. So what do we usually do? There's usually a lot of proliferation, a lot of add-ons to what's going on. Maybe my favorite example of this happened when I was teaching with Joseph somewhere and we're sitting in the kitchen having a cup of tea and um, somebody came into the kitchen in some distress and said to Joseph, I had this really terrible experience. So Joseph said, well, what happened? And he said, well, I felt all this tension in my jaw and I realized I'm just an incredibly uptight person and I always have been and I always will be. And Joseph said, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And he said, yes, and I've never been able to get close to people. It's never going to change. And Joseph said, you mean you felt a lot of tension in your jaw? And it's really interesting for me, like watching them go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Joseph said something to him like, why are you adding a miserable self-image to a painful experience? It's painful enough to feel all that tension in your jaw. Now on top of that, you're adding, I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. So one of the ways we talk about mindfulness is let's look for the add-ons. Let's look for what we're adding on that's distorting our actual experience. We have physical pain. We have heartache. We have disappointment. How many times do we add on what's it going to feel like tomorrow? What's it going to feel like next week? What's it going to feel like next year? So we're not even dealing with what is genuinely uncomfortable but we're also trying to deal with this world of anticipation, which is impossible. And so we feel defeated and we give up. So how are we with our experience? That's the whole point. Mindfulness isn't so much about what's happening. It's about how we are with what's happening. And therein lies our freedom because we can't actually control what's going to happen. You can't say, I'm not going to be frightened anymore, ever. I've grieved long enough. It's over. I'll never fall asleep meditating again. Because when conditions come together for something to arise, it will arise. Certainly we can affect conditions, and we do. You know, maybe you decide to meditate at a time when you haven't just had like a 15-course meal, for example, and likely to be sleepy. We do affect conditions, but we can't utterly control them. We're not sort of in charge of the universe in that way. And so we really find freedom in relating differently. We don't have to take everything to heart. We don't have to add on this miserable self-image. We don't have to add on a really bleak future that we actually don't know anything about. So we look for the add-ons. And this becomes really interesting when we are dealing with painful experience, emotional pain, physical pain. Many of us have the conditioning where we then add on shame, blame, anger, fear, a kind of dismay. This is who I really am. This is all that I'll ever feel. Isolation. I'm the only one all of which are distorting and untrue and increase our pain tremendously. I mean, there's pain in life. Some things just hurt. This is like one of my mottos. Uh, some things just hurt. And I don't believe it's because we have a bad attitude or because we need to change our perspective. Some things just hurt. And I always say, I want someone to make T-shirts for me or cups or caps that say something's just hurt. And in fact, in fact, a friend just sent me two cups that say something's just hurt. So I'm very happy, but I don't have them in this room. What we don't need is the extra suffering. 
that is really from the construct of our minds, from the stories we tell ourselves about who we are, what we're capable of, what the future will hold, and so on. We can learn, and we do learn, it's a skills training to be with painful feeling, and I'm relying on it a lot these days, to be with painful feeling in a different way. First of all, if seeing my own anger and fear and all of those states, instead of calling them bad or wrong, call them painful. That's what they are. And that's a whole different response. Instead of rejection and trying to make them go away and deny what we're feeling, it's like, ooh, use some compassion. There's also a huge difference between feeling something and being lost in it. And one of my favorite definitions of mindfulness actually came from an article I read years ago in the New York Times where it was about nowadays mindfulness programs in schools are much more prevalent, but this was quite a long time ago. And it was one of the very, very early ones. And it was a pilot program in a fourth grade classroom in Oakland, California. And so they asked one of the kids, so he's in fourth grade, let's say he's nine or 10 years old. They asked him, what is mindfulness? What is mindfulness? And he said, mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth. That's what mindfulness means. And I love that definition because what does it imply? It implies, first of all, knowing what we're feeling very quickly, not after it's escalated, not after we've sent the email, not after we've lashed out at somebody, but really as something is arising. It also implies a certain balanced relationship to our anger. If we hate it, we fear it, and try to repress it and push it down, we get tighter and tighter and tighter until we explode. But at the same time, if we just get overwhelmed by it, and consumed by it, and defined by it, we'll probably hit a lot of people in the mouth because life can be really frustrating. If we can find that place in the middle, and sometimes we call mindfulness the place in the middle, we can really connect to what's going on, but with some space. And in that space, options may arise. Ways of behavior may arise that we hadn't considered before. Creativity can arise. I like to think of that kid having that space where you might consider, you know what? Hit someone in the mouth. Last week didn't work out that well. Let me try this. And in fact, I have a story in my forthcoming book is also in my last book because I liked it so much. Um, I have these friends uh, who work in Baltimore with an organization called the Holistic Life Foundation, bringing tools of yoga and meditation to inner city youth. And there was one little girl, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years old, they've been teaching and she was always getting into fights and getting into a lot of trouble kids would tease her in different ways and she would just like punch them out and they taught her how to meditate so one day they walked into the gym or some public place and she had this other little girl like up against the wall by the throat and then she looked at her and she said you're just lucky I know how to meditate and she dropped her and she went off into a corner and kind of composed herself so uh, I like this story so much I keep putting it in my books um it doesn't mean you don't feel anything and it doesn't mean you never respond to anything, that you don't do anything. One of the problems I think with the word mindfulness is that it can seem so passive and so complacent. And that's, I think, a problem of language. A lot of the ways mindfulness is defined are true, but also misleading for us. Like mindfulness is a state of accepting things the way that they are or mindfulness means being with our experience without judgment, it does sound kind of passive, right? And I think often we're going to meditate together in a moment, but I think often of um, this time when I was leading a meditation class and very often, even if we're using the breath as that kind of primary object or steadying object, we start by listening to sound because it's a way of just relaxing and and opening up our awareness. So I had gotten just that far in the instructions. I said, let's sit and listen to sound. And someone raised their hand and said, 
what if it's the sound of the smoke alarm going off? Should I sit here knowing the smoke alarm's going off and being mindful, or should I get up? I said, I'd get up. You know, you don't have to lose intelligence or common sense, but it sounds that way, doesn't it? Like we're gonna accept things the way that they are. There's the smoke alarm, there's a sound. But it's not like that. We move, we respond, we care, we act, but maybe not driven by the habits of old. So mindfulness gives us a way of being with painful experience and shifting our relationship to it, which is the whole point. And it also gives us a way of being with pleasant, beautiful, wondrous, delightful things in a different way. For many of us, we have very funny conditioning around that as well, where maybe we're so distracted, we don't even take in what's really good. Many evolutionary biologists would say that we are wired to look for danger, for threat. We have a negativity bias. It actually takes some conscious effort or intentionality to open to the good. Maybe we have impossible standards of the joy we should be accessing and we're not. I have a friend who... um, One year in Washington, D.C., where there's this area um, called the Basin, where there's a a big concentration of cherry trees, and they bloom at once, and so that's cherry blossom season. So one year, my friend got me to that area to see the cherry blossom season, and I just thought it was so beautiful. It was so, like, such delicate pink blossoms and so many of them and I was just in awe and then my friend said oh no it's past the peak and I thought I'm not having a good experience it's past the peak it's not good enough right and we do that and we also sometimes there's too much guilt or we avoid pain we think we don't a pleasure we think we don't deserve it there's too much pain in the world in our own life or in others lives and We don't realize that the experience, the very open-hearted experience of joy will lift us up and actually give us the strength to deal with adversity. And uh, probably my most famous story about that was about going to Maui uh, to teach with Ramdas one year. And I left New England where it was like freezing cold. It was like December. And I went to Maui. And Maui, of course, is Maui. (laughs) It's just unearthly beauty. And the retreat venue that they would rent was right on the beach, it was right in the ocean. And I was with my friends and it was all amazing. And it was a retreat. So it was on my public schedule because all of a sudden people were writing me all the time and saying, wow, you're on Maui. And I wrote back very quickly. It's very humid here, it's just very, very humid. And uh, what's that? You know, like we can't even allow ourselves the joy that is there. We don't have to seek more. It's right there. But I couldn't allow it. And I used that example in a talk. So it became a thing in the course because I was walking out of the meditation hall one day and behind me was a friend. And the now adult son of another friend. And he was saying to her, my mom really wanted to come here. She so much wanted to come and she couldn't make it. She feels so bad. And, and I heard my friend say, did you tell her how humid it is here? And every time I went to Maui after that, people would just write me and say, how humid is it? Or something like that, you know? So we can have a very distorted relationship to pleasure and to joy. And we can even have a distorted relationship to neutrality. The ordinary, repetitive, routine times, just taking a breath, just listening to a sound, just one more cup of tea, very ordinary, where we bored, we're listless, we, we, it's not good enough, we want something more exciting, and so we're not really alive, and the mindfulness is really changing our relationship to pain, to pleasure, 
and to neutrality so we can be much more present and wholehearted and full and really take in our experience in a different way. So that's a skill. And in these times, I find myself using all three aspects of that. Certainly, there's some very painful feelings arising, uh, anxiety and grief and so many things. And I have to remind myself also to look for the joy. Don't deny it. Let it happen. Take it in. And that even the neutral moments are precious. It's life. And that I can really connect in a different way. And then the last skill is connection or loving kindness or compassion. It's often, I think it, it looks kind of odd too, you know, because you may be meditating all alone. Maybe your eyes are closed, but somehow it's a profound connection to all of life. It really brings us to a place where we say, oh, look at that. Everybody really does want to be happy. And we may define that differently and that we have very different conditioning about where happiness is to be found, but everybody really wants to be happy. And look at that. We are all so vulnerable to change, to loss. We don't share the same measure of pain, but we do share that vulnerability. So we feel the sense of oneness and it's very genuine. It's, it's almost like that sense of self and other and us and them is a useful construct in some realms, but it's just a construct. And we get to see, oh, what is the deeper truth? It really has something to do with the fact that our lives are all connected. It doesn't mean you like everybody and it doesn't mean you're gonna invite them to dinner or whatever, especially these days. But deep down, we know that our lives have something to do with one another and that everybody counts, everybody matters, and that we can respond to this world in a very, very different way because of that. One way of saying that is loving kindness. One way of saying that is compassion. Fundamentally, it's about connection rather than alienation or disconnection. I was once in a car with a friend and driving and we were stuck in this like incredible, awful, terrible traffic and complaining bitterly about it the whole time. And at one point my friend turned to me and said, well, we're the traffic too, you know? I thought, oh, right. You know, what's that sense of like, it's my road, I own it. These interlopers are like in my way, slowing me down. We're the traffic too. So what about when kind of the bottom falls out from that sense of it's mine. I own the earth. I am the central pivot around which everything revolves. And here we are together. It's very much just we. Here we are. And now how do we live? And how do we respond? So. Um, that's the place where the inner work and the outer manifestation really become one. And so we move, we speak, uh, we seek change, we try to help in a very, very different way than we might have before. So let's sit together and practice some skills. If you want to get comfortable, we say that so much of meditation practice is about balance and it's manifest right away in our posture. If you want some energy in your body, which means your back straight, if you're sitting, if you're not lying down, but not like so straight that you're really stiff and uptight. You also want to be relaxed and at ease. So you find your way into what feels like a balanced posture for you. You can close your eyes or not, wherever you feel most comfortable. And we'll start by listening to sound. I always feel funny after telling that story, like, what's going to happen? 
unless you are responsible for responding to that sound, whatever it is, let it wash through you. Maybe the sound of my voice or other sounds. Of course we like certain sounds and we don't like others, but we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Just let them come, let them go. Bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. Bring your attention to your hands and see if you can move from the more conceptual level, like go fingers, to the world of direct sensations. Picking up pulsing, throbbing, pressure, whatever it might be. You don't have to name these things, but feel them. And on that same level, bring your attention to the feeling of the breath. And this system is just the normal natural breath. You don't have to try to make it deeper or different. See if you can find the place where the breath is strongest for you or clearest for you. Maybe it's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. Let the breath come to you. If you like, you can use a quiet mental notation like in, out, or rising, falling to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet. So your attention is really going to feeling the breath one breath at a time. And if images or sounds or sensations or emotions should arise, but they're not very strong, if you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by your breathing. Just one breath.
If something comes up and it is strong, strong emotion, strong sensation, see if you can recognize it. Just acknowledge what's there without holding on or pushing away. And then see if you can come back to the feeling of the breath. And for all those, perhaps many times you're just gone, swept up in fantasy, lost in thought, or you fall asleep. Truly don't worry about it. We say the most important moment in the whole process is the next moment after you've been gone, after you've been lost. It's the ability to let go gently and to bring your attention back to begin again. You can let go of anything, come back to the feeling of the breath. We say the healing is in the return, not in never having wandered to begin with. So instead of blaming yourself or feeling like you failed, see if you can let go gently. And with some joy, bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Sharon. That was lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to move into anything after a lovely meditation like that. We're sort of often in a other place. So everyone can take their time and coming back. Um, but just, it's so fun to listen to you, to 
hear the, the, the tools and the stories and the humor and the humanness <laughs> and the practicality in them all. So it's, it's just so helpful, especially in these times. So there are a couple of questions that have come through um, during your talk. And one of them is that the thing that we were talking about with the neutral moments, so Jess asks about struggling with those neutral moments, um, that it seems like that's all we, a lot of us have right now are these very mundane, again and again, sort of way of being when we're in this sort of shut down uh, mode. Um, and she asks about, you know, if you would talk more about working with those neutral moments and finding happiness when in that sort of everyday, the same sort of thing. Sure. I mean, I think we have to, you know, in some ways take it up as an adventure, uh, which seems so antithetical to all of our conditioning because an adventure is not a neutral moment, you know, it's like some dazzling, exciting, different thing that's kind of intense. And many of us, not just a few of us, depend on intensity to feel alive. And if things are not that intense, we seek stimulation. and. Um, we just get caught in this cycle and it's especially hard for a lot of people now because our choices are so constrained. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was teaching earlier today and uh, just using the example of when I first came back from India in 1974 as a teacher, um, you know, if I was at a party or some social situation and introduced as a meditation teacher, people would kind of go, oh, that's weird. And now, you know, and what I usually say is now when I'm at a part of your social situation, and I thought, no, you don't do that right now. You know, that's not happening right now. You've got to say something else. And uh, There's so much that we can't, you know, kind of um, get that intense hit from that maybe we're accustomed to. And that's not all bad, actually. Uh, in the sense that, you know, we can find a new way of looking at what actually is. And so, like, I've had teachers, for example, in terms of mindfulness, say, uh, pay attention every time your hands are in water. Um, and it's actually a lovely experience, except I'm not usually think I'm not usually present. I'm usually thinking, I've got to do this, I'm going to do that, and then I've got to go there, and then, you know, and so to actually just stop and feel, um, to not always be multitasking, which is a big part of our missing things. You know, if you're drinking a cup of tea, very commonly you would be also checking your email, also on a conference call, also whatever, you know, and so we don't smell the tea, we don't taste the tea, it's like nothing. And it's very rare that we use an awareness of our awareness as a measure of how things might shift. Usually we blame the tea. You know, I'm so bad. I use a tea bag. What if I use a tea bag? I should, go, I should order some loose tea and I should heat the water, you know. But if we drink that next cup of tea in just the way we drank the last cup of tea, not really tasting it, not really smelling it, not really feeling the warmth of the teacup, it's another wasted experience. And then we think, well, I need, you know, and so it's a, it's a big cycle for many of us. And so it's really just making the experiment. Like my teacher saying to me, pay attention every time your hands are in water. And it's like a game you play with yourself, but it kind of, things pop. Um, especially when we're paying attention. And you also might see some things that are kind of interesting and, and, not necessarily so pleasant. Like I have a friend who said one of the um, ways we were urged to practice is to choose some daily activity that you do many times a day perhaps, and that's not any great thing, you know. Uh, but really try to use it as a meditation. So my friend chose brushing his teeth, and he said the first thing he noticed was that he was holding on so tightly to that toothbrush it was like it could be a jackhammer about to leap out of his hand and cut off his head. And that intrigued him. He thought, I wonder where else I might apply inappropriate pressure, you know, which is actually very stressful. So he began just paying attention to how he was holding objects. And it became like a whole meditative process for him there. So it's actually a very profound practice to be able to do. 
Thank you. Um, and maybe that's a similar answer for this next question. Um, so, you know, we're in these really unusual, uncertain times, and it's uh, in, in addition to some people feeling this mundaneness, there's also sort of hitting traumas, like old traumas, like coming up. And when the trauma body sort of takes over, practice can be really hard. It's hard mm -hmm. to remember. It's hard to access. Um, and sometimes I almost think like dark night of the soul type stuff, right? When the practice is so far away. And you were talking earlier about gun, uh, working with people who had been exposed to gun violence and the trauma of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the other side of not mundane, but when like trauma body takes over and how to work with that. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly it's very common. Somebody kind of schooled me many years ago. Uh, and she said to me, in terms of teaching large groups, which had been, you know, what I would do, uh, physically present large groups, she said to me, there's always trauma in the room. You just have to take that for granted. And what that necessitates in response is a kind of flexibility, because um, I'll go back to what I was saying about balance when I was talking about posture. Uh, it's a strong belief, like in meditative systems, that our work is to bring ourselves into greater balance. And out of that balance, the things we want, like insight and love and so on, they will emerge all by themselves. So it's not like we grab after experience and hold on to it and use it as a trophy or something like that. We're just working to come into balance. And balance always looks different. It looks different for any one of us at different times. It looks different between people. Um, and if you're in a state where uh, old traumas are being reawakened, there's often a temptation to either try to tough your way through or, or break through, and it's like too much force. It's too much energy. We need to settle back more. We need to titrate more that's one of the great lessons and um so you may not be able to do practice in the ordinary sense but you can be working in a different way and that's fine that's real practice it's not like you're doing secondary work you're doing the work of coming into greater balance right now so one aspect of that um is from the buddhist perspective Suffering is not redemptive. The point is not to suffer. And we know that some people suffer a lot and they emerge with love and connection and faith and other people are bitter and angry and isolated. It's different. So it's the response to the suffering, not the suffering itself that is the point. So to sit somewhere and suffer and feel like that's a path, it's not true. And and it's just harming ourselves. We get exhausted. And so that doesn't mean we can avoid pain, painful feeling, but it has to be approached with some intelligence. So in 1984, we brought this Burmese teacher, Saira Upandita, um, to Barry, to the Insight Meditation Society, to teach a three-month retreat. And we'd never met him before, but we heard he was a really great teacher, which he was. So we invited him. He was a great teacher, and he also was like really tough and really fierce and really intense. And one day he was doing a question and answer session in the meditation hall, and someone said to him, how long should I just be with physical pain before I move my attention to something that's easier to be with, like listening to sound or doing loving kindness meditation or something like that? It was actually a very profound question because we use physical pain as the template for emotional pain of all kinds. And I thought, given Upandija's personality, he was going to say, you should be with the pain till you fall over. I really did. And much to my surprise, he said, don't be with the pain for very long. He said, be with the pain, move your attention to something that's easier. Go back to the pain. Leave it again. And he said, it's not wrong to like be with the pain and be with the pain and be with the pain, but you'll likely get exhausted. So why not build in balance all along the way? So that's the first thing I really try to emphasize. You know, the sort of militant attitude of like, I'm not going to sleep and I'm not going to eat and I'm going to break through my trauma. 
it's just going to harm you that we're not looking for that. We're looking for balance and maybe balance means taking a walk. Maybe balance means lying down when you're practicing. Maybe balance means practicing for five minutes, you know, or three minutes. And, or maybe it means practicing drinking that cup of tea rather than a practice of stillness. It certainly might mean with your eyes open. Um, It might mean not listening to the news 18 hours a day, if that's really, uh, well, even, there's no ifs. I mean, I wouldn't listen to the news 18 hours a day, no matter what. But, you know, for many of us, that's very, it's a very difficult situation. Um, It's difficult for me to listen to the news, for example, and, Um, I do to the extent in which I feel it's important for me to connect or to know. And beyond that, I don't, um, you know, so it's finding your way and and usually finding your way within the context of community or a teacher who can mostly it's help reassure, you know, you are practicing. It's just looking different. And I, I heard someone wants to find trauma as, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, whatever that abnormal situation was or is. And so uh, not to stigmatize it and not to feel that it's a, you know, a defect in some way. Um, it's something that is crying out for us to learn a different kind of balance um, so that we have some choice and that we're not just subject to a certain reaction and, and the bottom line is having some compassion for ourselves. So there are tools, you know, and um, we have to be willing to make the experiment and to not have some ideal of like, you know, sitting in a pretzel like pose for hours on end, eyes closed. And then we turn on the news and we watch that for the next 18 hours. It's not going to work. That's so helpful. Thank you. Um, and it leads to several other questions that are coming up. So it's hard to know how to order them. But um, the next one uh, is from Keller. And it's this idea of um, suffering and joy. You talked about, you know, watching the news. And there's so many people who are suffering. Um, and yet, you know, she was talking about having feelings of joy. Uh, and when others are suffering, when a loved one is suffering. Um, and can you speak into that, sort of that, how to approach the guilty feelings of feeling joy? Yeah. I mean, I think it's natural that we feel guilty, but at the same time, um, it's always good to have a kind of self-scrutiny or introspection to understand that uh, it's not necessarily selfish or self-centered to experience the joy. It's how we keep going. It gives us energy. And it's not easy to look at these things. And, you know, someone you care about is really suffering or, um, just the pain in the world. It's not easy. So I, I think it takes a lot of honesty to understand that. How do I keep going? You know, like how do I seek change, for example, um, in a sustained way or in a better way? And it's it's not going to be through depletion and exhaustion and and being miserable. It's just not. You know, we run out of juice, and and so. Uh, Take baby steps, you know, allow yourself some joy, even in the presence of the guilt. Um, It doesn't have to mean that you're denying the pain. One of the stories I tell uh, in my book, um, because I have been going down to Parkland and teaching, and was uh, the first time I ever went, somebody raised her hand. She had not been at the school that day, but her mother was. Her mother was a teacher there, and she wasn't harmed, but it was a, you know, horrible day, and um, she said, I feel really guilty sitting here. Like, uh, you know, there, there were several mindfulness and meditative um, opportunities that, that were being offered. And she said, I feel really guilty with all of these opportunities because it feels wonderful to be here and I'm having an incredible day. And I know it wouldn't have happened except for that horrible thing. And I don't know how to get over it and actually just enjoy this and, I said, you know, I don't know if we ever get over it per se, but we learn to hold them both at once and not to deny ourselves the joy 
because of the genuineness of the pain. Because if that's what happens, I mean, really, we just got to go to bed, you know? It's like, who can handle the immensity, you know, of how wrong things seem um, without something to, to uphold us? Yeah, it reminds me of what you were saying about titrating as well. Making sure that you go to the good things seems important. Um, June writes about, uh, apart from the pandemic, feeling frightened for the country. So watching news, hearing all the various things about our leaders and the greed and dishonesty and things that might be happening, um, and that it brings up a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. And how do we overcome fear? I think we... um it's a couple of things, you know. One is sitting with our fear and looking at its nature, you know, because one of the things I've discovered sitting with my own fear and looking at it is that I'm not so afraid, even though it's like the world's pronouncement that we're afraid of the unknown. I'm not so afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid when I think I do know and it's going to be really bad. And it's the stories I tell myself that really get me going. And if even in the midst of that kind of arc of anxiety, when I remind myself, I don't know, then I feel space. And in that space, I feel some ease. I don't know. So that's part of it. And part of it, I think at the root of a lot of these extremely uncomfortable feelings, fear, in the Buddhist psychology, fear and anger are the same mind state. They're just two different forms, anger being the energized, outflowing form, fear being the held-in, frozen form of striking out against what's happening, wanting to declare it to be untrue. And if we can sit with those feelings, then they're complex, you know, and so usually we see different strands, like there's moments of sadness, there's moments of this, there's moments of that, and almost always at the root of it is a sense of helplessness. And I find if I can get there, if I can actually see the the feeling of helplessness, then I determine on an action something, even if it seems very small. And, you know, this has been going on for a long time now, just in terms of the pandemic. Um, I remember in the beginning, the very beginning, before, uh, actually before lockdown, when there was so much anxiety and You know, I'd be talking to people, and sometimes the only thing that really brought them some joy was connection. You know, like somebody told me they were they were in New York City, and they had an elderly neighbor, and every evening they would sit. You know, like probably more than six feet apart. I'd say probably twenty feet apart in the hallway and have a conversation, because as as my friend said. You know, she's used to being a very active person and engaged in a lot of ways, and it was all gone. So every night they sat together, and he taught her how to meditate, and they chatted. And uh, I remember somebody else who, like, the first time she felt relief um, from her own anxiety was doing grocery shopping for an elderly neighbor. And, And a lot of that felt, you know, was not people weren't able to do, I mean, he could still sit when he was still in New York with his neighbor, but, you know, she couldn't necessarily go shopping. It was, it was things got so complicated, but, you know, people found a way, like several people in New York told me, I lived here in this apartment for you know, like 12 years. I never knew my neighbor's name, names. And now I know everybody's name and number because we've all agreed that we're going to stay in touch in case something happens, we have to help each other, you know, so that that feeling of helplessness is like the worst. And it breeds a lot of other feelings that are very difficult for us. But if we can get there and acknowledge it and do just one thing, you know, or one thing at a time, even if it seems very small, we will have a very different handle on our experience. That's a beautiful story of the, with the things that are happening, those connections. Um, and, and sort of speaking about connection, um, it's connection to others, but someone else was writing about connection to our higher self. 
Um, Ashley asks about if you have insights. Um, so when we sort of get knocked off balance, um, developing coherence with the higher self. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in, in Buddhist language, maybe we'd call that aspiration, like, or sometimes I describe it as the story we tell ourselves, you know, like, who do we think we are? What are our lives are about? What are our deepest values? What do we care about more than anything? Um, and often that's a process of remembering. I swear, I think beginning again is the, it's like the first thing I learned and it's probably the most important thing I learned and I always relearn it because we will get knocked off. You know, people say to me back in the days when we had retreats, you know, like how do I keep this level of concentration when I leave here and, and go back to work or how do I stay mindful all day long at work? And I would say you won't, but you can start over and you can start over more gracefully and you can start over more quickly as time goes on, but it's not like a straight shot, you know, it just isn't. And that's okay because we can start over. And it's, I think, a pretty unrealistic and unfair expectation that uh, that's not going to happen. You know, we're never going to fall down. We are. But what an amazing thing that we can start over. And so um, that's not a problem. You know, that's not failing. And people would have different ways, you know, like I, I sometimes literally ask myself, okay, what do I really care about? And that's good if you're paying attention to intention. Like before a uh, conversation with somebody or if you're working outside the home and, and you know, before a meeting of some kind, um, before an encounter, I usually suggest asking yourself, what do I want to see come from this more than anything? Do I want to be seen as right? Do I want to have a resolution? Do I want to be helpful? Do I want to grind them into dust? Like, where am I coming from? What's my intention? Because that will reflect our greater sense of purpose. And um, if we can get in touch with that, then again, we have options, you know, like, Maybe we want to grind them into dust and you think, well, really? Maybe not, you know. Uh, but we need that pause before rushing into action or speech so that we can we can get in touch. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. It sort of speaks into this next question as well. Um, so the, part of this comes from Michael, um, who says, loves your work. Um, and then talks a lot about this culture of uh, shaming and judging um, and that falling into that trap of shaming others mentally, even if not doing it verbally. And it, you know, and I can see this in lots of spiritual teachings of like, even the spiritual teachings can be used to sort of shame or control or shut down others um, in the, you know, even when it comes in the form of a spiritual truth. So um so how do we focus on loving them instead is sort of the question that's coming through. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly spiritual teach any teaching can be used that way. And um, I think, you know, some of it is, is really using your own experience as a kind of laboratory and also knowing what you want, you know, in this interaction. Like, do you want this person... Maybe you're actually kind of close to them. Do you want them to change behavior or see something from a different angle? If that's what you actually want, that's different than you want to hurt them, you know, which may be what you genuinely want, you know. So, uh, again, you know, mindfulness plays a, a really big role. So let's say you want a shift in behavior or you want to be heard. You want your point of view acknowledged, something like that. Then the question to ask oneself is, how do I learn something? And I was teaching somewhere once, um, I guess in February, which was the last time I was in California. And uh, 
there was a psychologist in the room and she said in response to something I said, something like, the brain filled with shame cannot learn. And it's such a delicate dance, isn't it? Because we have to be able to acknowledge, oh yeah, I screwed up or um, I caused pain or I broke some harmony or I didn't do so well or, or whatever. And in a way, just like feel it and be able to move on with some energy, like not to do it again. I'm laughing because I'm thinking about, uh, in Buddhist psychology, they would talk about the difference between what we would call remorse, which is genuinely feeling that pain of having messed up in some way, but sort of like lessons learned. I'm gonna really try to be different as compared to guilt. Um, which is more like being stuck there. Like, I'm such a bad person. I'm always bad. That's all I ever do, you know? So it's really being stuck and it leaves us so drained that it's not considered very helpful because we don't have the energy to move on and be different. So um, Upandita Sayadaw came to Barry in 1984. In 1985, I went to Burma, uh, which is where I did my first really intensive experience of loving kindness meditation. And Ramdas was there also meditating and Joseph was there also meditating and the way the system was of doing what we call interviews with Upandita where you describe your practice and then he gives you some feedback was he'd be sitting like in his living room and whoever's turn it was would go up to the front of the room and describe their practice and in the meantime, the person who was next would wait in the back of the room. So you'd hear, you know, everything about the person just ahead of you. And the rotation was Ramdas, Joseph, me in that, in that particular section. And, uh, because I was doing loving kindness meditation, Ramdas was very interested in my experience. So he said he used to go to the back of the room and pretend he was taking notes of what Upandita had just told him so he could get through Joseph to hear me. And uh, so anyway, I heard Joseph's thing for like three months. And one day I could just tell from the tone of voice he was describing his experience that he was really kind of down. And what he said to Upandita was, I had this memory when I was practicing or something, I don't know how many years before, let's say 35 years before, something like that. Um, I had this memory of something I did like 35 years ago, which was really bad. And it really caused a lot of harm. And Upandita said in response to him, well, yeah, we do feel the pain when we have that recollection. And you also don't want to get stuck there and, you know, be able to use it as a kind of feeder to move on and, and try to do better. So the whole time I was sitting in the back of the room thinking, I wonder what Joseph did. It sounds terrible. He would have been very young. I don't know what it was. So we were on the silent retreat, so I couldn't ask him. And a couple of months went by and then we left Burma at the same time we were in Bangkok and, that first night we were sitting in a restaurant having dinner. And I said, by the way, <laughs> way back when in Burma, when you were telling you Pandita about this terrible thing you did, what'd you do? And he described, he was like 16 years old and um, this girl had a sweet 16 party and he didn't feel like going. And so we didn't go. And then it turned out not a lot of people went and she was just devastated. And all those years later, it just came back. So then we came back to the States and we we're teaching in California. It happened to be my birthday. Uh, and we were at the center. So I, I told that story, you know, as an example of the difference between guilt and remorse. And, um, and then the staff gave me a birthday party and Joseph came and he said, didn't really feel like coming. I was very tired, but I figured in 30 years, I'll be sitting minding my own business and I'll all come back. I missed your party. Um, you know, so we can learn, but it's a very important distinction uh, because we will feel the pain of that and it's rightful and it can also 
devolve into something else that's just going to drag us down. It's not that helpful. Um, can you also just take a few seconds to talk about when we do it to others, like when we shame others? Yeah, well, that's what, like I use, I use myself as the laboratory because yeah. it's very tempting to then, you know, you should have known better and you, you really did this horrible thing. And, but that's where I have to come back to my intention. It's like, do I really want them to hear something? Mm. How do I hear things? Do I really want them to change? How do I change? Thanks. You know, and I, I, I just find like getting a wash and guilt and shame and mortification. It's tempting, but it's not really an effective way. And we do see it a lot. And, and it's, it's hard because we, we may have a lot we need to look at, you know, and in the manner of regret. But when does it become something else? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. Well, we've actually gone a little bit past the end of our time. But I want to ask just two more questions before we wrap up. Um, and there's many more I'd actually like to ask, but just out of respect for time. Um, and one is that there's uh, someone was talking about reading an article um, about meditation and it brought up a little bit of fear because uh, there's some people who uh, in which meditation practice can lead to depression and insomnia. That's what she was reading about or he. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about that. Um, I think the best thing to do, you know, if you feel uneasy or uncertain is find yourself a teacher, even in this day and age, you know, because it's easy for any one of us to forget, like the goal is balance. And um, it, it shouldn't be that the meditation practice in and of itself causes things to get worse, but often a lot is revealed. I mean, I'm famous for once having marched up to my first teacher, Goenka, and saying, I never used to be an angry person for before I started meditating, thereby, you know, it's it's all your fault, clearly. Of course, I've been hugely angry, but I hadn't seen it, and it was very uncomfortable to see it, and I needed a lot of help in seeing it without getting lost in it, and so um, it's easy to try too hard. There's, there's all kinds of stuff, and uh, but you can also experiment and see, you know, maybe walking meditation, maybe chanting, maybe something else, um, where you're doing the same kind of mental exercise. <clears throat> you know, Krishnadas will always say, like, if you're chanting, you'll start thinking about something else. See if you can gently let go and come back and, um, and feel empowered by that. You know, it's not like you can't do this one thing. Uh, you're going to find a path that works for you. Yeah. Um, and then kind of a follow-up for that, how does one go about finding a teacher today? It's a very interesting question because you can't really go downtown or something, you know, necessarily. I would, I would, um, I would read. I would uh, find friends. I would find a community, maybe even before a teacher, and uh, feel empowered. You know, check people out. It doesn't have to be a teacher for a lifetime, but if it's a situation that you trust, at least to experiment with um, for a while and and see what happens, then, then you do that. I mean, there's such a huge amount happening online. It's almost overwhelming. Um, and, you know, and, and really check it out. Um, see what your experience is in a very practical way with, with different things. And, and so, um, and, I, and I think once you sort of feel a, an orbit, you know, or a constellation of a group being like this foundation, for example, you know, then you may find different personalities teaching within it or offering different methods, but you can have a certain sense of, of security or safety. Beautiful. And then the last question before we wrap up, um, you had talked earlier about loving kindness and loving awareness. And I'm curious if you could talk about the relationship between the two. 
Yeah, I mean, loving awareness, I think, as Ramdas, you know, would so often use the phrase, um, is is a way of describing mindfulness. Some people don't like the word mindfulness. It sounds too clinical <coughs> or cold. Um, and so there's a lot of effort to find another way of saying it. Some people say kindfulness or heartfulness or Ramdas's was really loving awareness, which I think in mindfulness, as I was taught, that loving part is implied. It's got to be there because if you see your own anger, for example, like I did, and you freak out and you feel I'm the worst person in the world, we actually wouldn't call that mindfulness um, because it's a, it's a, mindfulness is a different relationship to what we're observing. Um, and it's got this quality of, of love in it, but uh, it's not like interpersonal love. It's, it's a, a deep, deep kind of acceptance and acknowledgement. Loving kindness is a particular technique of meditation where um, we're actively, I call it stretching. It's like we're calling different beings to mind, ourselves, friends, um, things like that, people like that, or beings like that. And we're actually repeating phrases like, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, as a kind of gift giving or offering. So um, it, it's its own method. And the quality itself is implicit in, in mindfulness and or explicit if you use the term loving awareness. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. I mean, it's such a rich conversation. You clearly have just a wealth of experience and knowledge and we're just graced by you sharing it with us tonight. Thank um, you. Yeah. So for all of you out there, um, check out her new book, Real Change. It's SharonSalzberg.com slash Real Change. And you can always hear a lot more from her. Um, there's the Meta Hour podcast on the Be Here Now Network that comes out regularly. So lots of good wisdom there. Um, and in terms of teachers and teachings, um, check out the local Ramdas fellowships. So there's this, the, we have these online fellowship calls, and then there's local fellowships that are meeting in ways right now as well. So if you want to get connected to your local fellowship, um, make sure you sign up on the ramdas.org slash fellowship uh, webpage. Also know that this talk and many other live streams are free on demand at ramdas.org org slash live stream. And there's going to be more coming up. Uh, we have a Dharma talk in um, August about purpose. And we have recently started our Instagram Soul Land music series. It's on Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. Trevor Hall kicked us off last this past Sunday and Jai Utah will be uh, joining us this Sunday. So make sure you check that out. It's at Baba Ramdas on Instagram. And I just want to give a big shout out and thanks to all the people on the back end that make this happen. You just mostly she sharing in a little bit of me, but there's Mangala and JR and Rachel and Kelly and Corey and Tanya and Brittany all out there have done pieces of to make this tonight happen. Um, and uh, lastly, we have an upcoming virtual retreat, August 28th and the 30th. And Sharon will be part of that, offering lots of wonderful Wisdom and Krishna Das and Duncan Trussell, Trevor Hall, I think Annie Lamont and Valerie Carr, and Nina Rao, and many other teachers will be there. So make sure you check that out. Um, and we just so appreciate you being here today. And to keep making these things happen, consider uh, supporting Love Serve Remember on the ramdas.org slash support page. So I think that's it. Any other announcements you have, Sharon? No, that's wonderful. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you Sunday on the Instagram Soul Land series. Have a lovely night. Rum, rum.